Hello and welcome to Money Life. This is Sucheta Dilal. We are going to revisit the Carvey issue this time. So what is Carvey? Carvey share and stock broking, as you know, was one of the biggest broker defaults that has happened in the last two and a half years when over 32 brokers defaulted on the National Stock Exchange. Obviously, they are also declared defaulters on any other exchanges where they are members. Now, what happened with Carvey was that since it was so big, there were over two and a half lakh investors and many of them even today haven't got their money back. The story is how C. Patsati, founder of Carvey along with his cabal, took away money which was with the brokerage firm in DMAT accounts, put it in an account which he did not report and from there pledged the shares belonging to investors to raise nearly 1000 crore which was then diverted and used for all kinds of activities, led to losses, the firm defaulted and people were left high and dry with big chunks of their savings having vanished. So what is new this time? On 8th March, the Enforcement Directorate in Hyderabad issued a provisional attachment order under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act against Patsati, the Karbi Group, his sons, Adiraj and Rajat Patsati and several key entities of the group, which is Carby Stockbroking, Carby Realty, Carby Financial Services, Carby Data Management Services, Carby Consultants, and Adi Rajat Commercial Enterprises, Adi Rajat Holdings, Compar Estates, and many others. In fact, there were 30. Now, the key point here is that you have the Securities and Exchange Board of India already, which is regulating market intermediaries, advisors, exchanges, brokers. It is extremely powerful today. SEBI, after several amendments, is one of the most powerful regulators in the world. And it has powers of search, seizure, arrest. The Carvey issue erupted in 2019 when SEBI issues an interim order which suspended its activities, said no movement out of the accounts because it was discovered that 1000 crores was raised by, raised by illegally pledging investors' shares. Now, on 2nd December 2019, SEBI did something else. It quickly told the National Depository, transfer all these shares which belong to investors to their respective DMAT accounts and away from Carvey. This actually saved over 82,000 out of about 90 or 90 or 1000 investors. Two good moves, right? What happened after that? Almost nothing for a whole year. C. Parthasati kept convincing both SEBI and NSE that he's going to sell Carvey Data Management Services, raise about a thousand crore and pay back investors. He said that to Money Life as well. We had been in touch with him. Thanks to my intervention, almost 100 people got a few uh, lakh rupees back and some of their shares. But the regulator's job was to do more than this, more than just have a forensic audit. It should have impounded all the assets of Carvey. It has the past to do it. It should have found out the names of companies. All this and more has been done by the Enforcement Directorate. Now, what does it say when the regulator does not use its powers to do what it has to and you need another national elite agency to come in and do the work that SEBI is supposed to do? I'm going to outline in this video blog all the things that the ED did, which could as well have been done by SEBI because and NSC, not NSC, NSC has no powers, but by SEBI because NSC reported all this to SEBI. SEBI should have got into top gear and looked at it. So what does it do? And I'm going to show you a lot of tables which we will keep so that you can take a look and read. Now, Enforcement Directorate looked at the National Stock Exchange's investigation. It was reported to SEBI. It has also taken a look at what the Serious Frauds Investigation Office has looked at through the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. This was done independently. Not much is known from what SEBI did. There was a final order. The broker was expelled exactly one year after it was suspended. But here are the findings. So the Enforcement Directorate has estimated the value of assets, dug them up, a very, very detailed investigation, and estimated the value of the assets of Carvey's founder, his family, group entities at 1,984.84 crore. Now take a look at this table. So you will see shares in Carvey Financial Technologies held by 
Sipat Sarthi, 438 crore. Shares held by him in all the companies, shares in DMAT and insurance companies, which is 19 crore, a whole bunch of assets that were pledged. These assets themselves run into hundreds of crores, their corporate offices and others. Carvi Data Management was a valuable company, nearly 904 crores. These are split up. Yeah, part of it is land assets, part of it is property, immovable properties by the group. Then a credit balance with Bajaj Finance and listed with two companies. One is the Carvi HOF and one is Compound. Now let's not get bogged down by details of these numbers. What is the size of the scam? That also was estimated by the Enforcement Directorate. It's a little less than these assets. So if the assets were 1,984, the scam was 1,922 uh, crore, which means enough of money to pay everyone back. But investors have been left high and dry for no fault of theirs. This is the point to remember. We're talking about 2019, we are in 2022. You think your money, which is forcibly dematerialized, you can't keep it in physical shares. You have to keep it with a depository account. Carvi was one of the biggest. Earlier, it used to be an r and agent. It has at least 10 companies which are under SEBI regulation. So you think it's safe. And the money is just transferred out. And various reasons are given to you why you can't get your money back. And there's nothing you can do about it as an investor. ED has done a lot more than SEBI. So 52 persons were interrogated, including five key officials who were also arrested. Now, this is something that's happened again over a year ago. C. Parthasati was arrested. He remains in jail along with his chief executive officer, chief financial officer, company secretary and head of compliance. All these people were interrogated, cross-examined, put in front of one another. Their disclosures and confessions were taken into account. Flow charts of properties, funds, shares and other assets were created and the layering that was done in order to hide the trail was dug up by Carvi. All this was required. Remember, 2,50,000 investors money was at stake. Now, here's the story that ED has documented in a nutshell. I'm going to keep it brief because you don't need to go into details. Carvi has always been borrowing funds, it needed funds for working capital, margin financing, it used to pledge shares. The problem arose in 2013-14 when it began to raise funds illegally by pledging clients' shares and diverting the money that it was raised to a bunch of shell companies. They were not originally shell companies. These were eight or nine, maybe 14 insurance brokerage companies, which the ED has named which had turned into shell because the original requirement of linking with one insurance company to be an insurance group, which was not required. So these were now conveniently used to divert money after layering it through various other companies and conduct a lot of trading. So the loans that went here was used as margin money and huge trades were done in all these companies. Made massive losses were racked up and these accumulated losses had to be then covered up. And there was no money. This is what caused the default. There were also non-performing assets in the financial, Carvi financial company, which C. Patsati was separately trying to hive off, but it had to be made to look attractive. So the NPAs were evergreened with this illegally borrowed money, causing further losses. Now, apart from this, where was the money going? Money was going to family members. Some of them are not even working with the group, but getting lavish salaries and perks running into crores of rupees. Yet, who's arrested? Only C. Parsati. This, of course, reminds people of a very Hyderabad situation where even Ramalinga Raju of Satyam wrote that explosive letter of confession saying the company was bankrupt, there were no profits. And since he confessed alone, the family members were left alone, very curiously, by the police, and he fell on the sword, so to say. So, Pat Sati seems to have done that. Family members are nicely out in the open. Yet five employees remain in jail with Mr. Pat Sati, who is apparently not having a bad time in jail. Now, the ED alleges that the entire Carvi fraud was run by a cabal of key executives. No family remember. They call them Pat Sati Secretariat Section. They also had back office control. Now, the attachment order, which I have access to and read, 
says of course at various times that Mr. Parth Sathi claimed that he was kept in dark about trading losses, didn't know how bad the situation was. We don't know. All that will be fought out in court. Today's video blog has a limited point of saying this is what one expected the regulator to know, to have its ears to the ground. In fact, to know it before the suspension in 2019, but at least act rapidly until 2022. It's more than two years. Now, like I said, the total fraud, 1922 crore. This is split up into who Carvey owes money to. Remember, it borrowed money from a bunch of banks and finance companies. So their money has to be returned. And I'm showing you the second chart if you look at it. HDFC Bank lent 329 crore, Lusin Bank 137 crore, ICICI Bank 562 crore, B. Rudra Gauda of BGP Enterprises and BKG Mining have lent 311 crore between the three. Axis Bank 182 crore, Bharat Cooperative Bank 29, Man Manvi 25, Bajaj Finance 344. And this money has gone back to investors. A whole lot of investors also have to get their money back because their shares have vanished and these had value. Now, even if we say that ED has made valuations which are an overestimation or fanciful, will be argued. Very clearly, there are assets which can pay back this massive liability. If you ask me, the people who are really cheated are investors. The big lenders had their eyes open, had the means to find out. They should come next in the queue. Because what they lent against was the illegal pledge of investors' money. Coming back to questioning what the regulator did. Regulator did not do any of the search seizure that I'm talking about. Investor protection under the SEBI Act is comes first in its preamble, even before market regulation and conduct of orderly markets. SEBI has the powers, but every time, whether it was Colo scam of 2015, we've done a lot of videos, or dodgy disclosures by listed entities, all that SEBI does is to order a separate independent forensic audit and ironically in the Colo scam, in fact, asking NSE to audit itself repeatedly. Contrast becomes so evident when you start looking at the ED order and the 30 companies and what they have found out. So I've already listed a number of them from the 30 entities, which were the core group companies. Then there's Mr. Parth Sarthi, HUF that he controls. Family firms, which are Adi Rajat, named after his two sons, commercial enterprises, Compar Estates and Agencies, Adi Rajat Holdings, all these were used to layer or divert funds. Then the shell companies that I talked about, not again going into detail, we are showing it to you on the screen Advanced Financial Services, Buoyant Insurance, Champion Insurance, Classic Wealth Management, First Mercantile Wealth Advisory, Pelican Wealth Advisory, NOAA Consultants, Vita Link. Wealth Advisory, Ultimate Insurance, Wizard Insurance, Zenith Insurance, Citadel Wealth Advisory, Suranj Consultancy and NOAA Wealth Management. No need to get into details. Five lenders already named HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank who have lent against shares also. They also lent against property. Axis Bank the same. Aditya Birla Finance and Bajaj Finance also lent against property. This has been listed by the ED. For instance, Carvey's big corporate headquarters in Jubilee Hills and Banjara Hills. So Carvey Millennium is a headquarters valued at 65 crores pledged to uh, Aditya Birla Finance. Then Carvey House at Banjara Hills estimated at 25 crores pledged to Axis Bank. Series of flats all over Hyderabad estimated at 13 crores pledged to HDFC Bank to raise funds. Documents and other claims were all very meticulously documented in a 300 odd page uh, attachment order of the ED. All this of course is going to be litigated. But my point is let's look at the key subsidiaries that ED discovered. Again, job of SEBI. Let's stick to Carvey Stock Broking, which was the main big brokerage entity which was suspended. Carvey Stock Broking alone had 15 subsidiaries that ED dug up. Hopefully, they would have assets, bank accounts, which if SEBI had acted fast enough, could have been frozen. 
So here again, we are showing you a table. Take a look. I'm not going to read out the names, but ca even Carvey stockbroking creates whole lot of names which are so similar to cause confusion. So when you're layering it and diverting, people don't realize they think it's all Carvey companies. So you have Carvey stockbroking, you have Carvey broking, you have another hidden DMAT account which is actually called Carvey stockbroking. Carvey com trade, realty, holdings, whatever. I'm running it slowly for you to look at, including. Carvey Inc. USA, Carvey Investment Advisory, Carvey Asia Pacific, Carvey Middle East, Private Wealth Consulting and Realty. Was there anything in these? Shouldn't the regulator have found out? Now let's come to the second big company which was part of the 4-5 core companies, Carvey Consultancy. This had nine subsidiaries under it, which I'm listing here. Carvey Consultants, Global Services, again a US company also, Carvey Services Inc. Carby Infrastructure, Carby Insights, Carby Analytics, Carby Insurance Repository, Shorapur Solar Power Project and Lotus Shielders. Third big company, which remember has 904 crore of assets, which is Carby Data Management Services, which he was hoping to hawk. This also has seven companies under it. Carby Infotech, Carby Next, Carby DigiConnect, Carby Forth Search, Skyno, tech and carbon in renewable energy. So you can imagine what different businesses, infrastructure, realty is where all this is being diverted to what end, what were the assets, how were the investments, nothing is known as yet. Then the family enterprises of the carbon group. Again, I've mentioned some of the names before, we're showing you this chart, take a look, nine companies even over here which to my mind was SEBI's job to dig up. In addition to this, there were those insurance companies we talked about. Only 8 are mentioned in SEBI orders. There are 14 insurance broking companies, altogether about 17 shell companies. All this unfortunately is cold comfort for investors because there is no way of getting their money. All they can do is they can apply to the National Stock Exchange which has come up with an artificial cap of 25 lakhs. So you may have 5 crores, 10 crores, 100 crores in Carvey DMAT. You will get only 25 lakhs. And there are other reasons and cutoffs that NSC has come up with on its own. Make some mockery of this whole concept of investor protection fund. I have taken this up with SEBI in a presentation. I've said this cap is artificial. The manner in which NSC decides whether or not to pay is artificial and people need to get back their money, there has to be disgorgement if you are not going to pay them. All this is completely separate but until investors wake up and fight and SEBI does something going beyond the two things that I listed earlier, it's not going to work. You have to continue to put pressure on SEBI. You have to tell them the 25 lakh cap is not good enough if you are a Carvey investor. You have to ask for some oversight. And you have to say this money has to be brought in. No other claim should be made. Investors money should come first because it was in trust. And when there is a fiduciary responsibility, it's not just with the National Depository or NSE. SEBI has compelled us as investors to dematerialize our shares. So SEBI itself has a fiduciary responsibility. But believe me, investors, nothing is going to happen if you don't wake up. All SEBI has done is impose a tiny penalty of 3 crore on the Bombay Stock Exchange, 2 crore on NAC for being lax. This money also does not come to investors. It goes to SEBI's Investor Protection Fund or the Consolidated Fund of the Government of India. The fraudulent transfer was not small, 2,300 crore. Big chunk of it may have been given back, but a few hundred crore still is outstanding. If you do not create precedents, do not fight for it, to allow yourself to be fobbed off with this artificial cap, you're going to face this over and over again. There have been 32 odd broker defaults, 35 plus if you talk, calculate them from 2018. It is up to you. If you agree, share this video, write to your MPs, write to SEBI, fight for your rights. Thank you. Mm -hmm.